Well, thank you so much for that generous introduction. Uh, it's really great to be with you in Washington this evening and uh, to be in uh, perhaps some simple way supportive of the work of the C.S. Lewis Institute. Uh, it's always a blessing when people ask you to talk about C.S. Lewis, so uh, it didn't take me long to say yes uh, to this invitation, that's for sure. And uh, I just want to say, I, I'll get into my remarks um, in a moment, but I just want to encourage you, as somebody who appreciates the ministry of the C.S. Lewis Institute, I appreciate getting the quarterly publication Knowing and Doing, uh, admire the leadership of Joel Woodruff and others, um, you have received a very simple, low-key, not a high-pressure invitation uh, to participate in the work of this institute through financial giving. And uh, part of my hope and prayer is that we uh, look at the discipleship life of C.S. Lewis this evening, that you are encouraged and inspired in something of the ethos of his life of discipleship and encouraged by that to want to see that not just in your own life but in the lives of others and that in some way that'll be an encouragement to you uh, in your own giving and uh, the opportunity you have uh, for giving this evening. I want to begin by uh, inviting you to come with me to the city of London um, just a couple of months ago. I wish you could have been there with me. Probably there are a few people here tonight who were there on November the 22nd when it was the 50th anniversary of the death of C.S. Lewis, and there was a memorial service giving praise to God for his life in Westminster Abbey. There were many things that were thrilling about that worship service uh, for me. One of them was that there's only one um, audio recording of C.S. Lewis's broadcast talks on, on the BBC during World War II, and part of that recording was played for us during the service, and so the living voice of C.S. Lewis was part of our, our worship experience. It was also thrilling to see the monument that was dedicated to C.S. Lewis in Poet's Corner. C.S. Lewis, as some of you may know, was a gifted poet. In fact, at a certain point in his life, uh, he had a, a dream and vision for um, becoming a, a great English poet, which was not God's calling for his life. But Lewis was more of a critic than a poet, and it's sometimes said that nobody ever erected a monument to a critic. Well, if you go to Westminster Abbey, you can see a monument to a critic, C.S. Lewis, perhaps the exception that proves the rule. It was also a thrill for me to be at that uh, worship service with my young daughter, Catherine. Uh, one of the things I, I try to do in, in some of my travels is take uh, some of my children with me from time to time, and somehow it seemed to me not just appropriate, but necessary for some children to be there to celebrate the life of C.S. Lewis, and uh, I'll comment uh, more on some of the reasons uh, for that later. It was also really moving uh, for me to hear some of the prayers that were offered, and let me just read you one of the prayers that was offered on that occasion, and uh, we can perhaps make it part of our prayer this evening. Almighty God, Father of lights and author of all goodness, we give thee humble praise for the life and work of thy servant C.S. Lewis. And beseech thee that as he has helped us look to a world beyond this world and to hopes better than our own, we may come with him to the fullness of everlasting joy, which thou hast prepared for them that truly love thee in the heavenly courts of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As I heard those and other prayers, I was filled with gratitude to God for C.S. Lewis, who in a way has been to me a lifelong friend and an inspiration in the life of Christian discipleship. And part of what I want to do in my talk this evening, and by the way, they didn't give me just three minutes, they gave me close to 30. Uh, let me just encourage you to get in a comfortable place in your chair. Uh, catch the eye of somebody across the table and give them a little nod if you need more coffee uh, and just settle in so that we can uh, revel in the life and teaching of C.S. Lewis. But part of what I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about my personal relationship with C.S. Lewis, which is an important part of my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. For me, all of this began as uh, perhaps it did for many of you with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's a book I, I heard before I was able to read it for myself, and yet I think even before that time, 
the name C.S. Lewis was mentioned so often in my childhood home that even though I wasn't sure who he was, he, I thought maybe he was a family member or somebody that we knew really well. Uh, I was born in 1966, so he wasn't even alive then, but uh, there was this sense of his living presence. I had a great love for the Narnia Chronicles when I was a child. I can remember um, the, the feeling of some resentment I had when my mother would stop reading to sort of point out some of the spiritual connections and how it related to biblical themes, and I, I wasn't about to let the story be ruined by somebody telling me what they meant. Uh, once I was able to read the stories for myself, I, uh, for myself, I often associated them, uh, associate them now with being sick because I consider that I didn't have a really satisfactory illness unless I had time to read all seven Narnia Chronicles, <laughs> either in uh, canonical order, starting with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or chronological order, starting with The Magician's Nephew. There were two ways to read them. Uh, one result of this is that the illness of uh, Diggory's mother in uh, The Magician's Nephew has always elicited deep feelings of empathy from me. I could relate to her situation. Uh, some people here perhaps will know my father um, has taught in the English department at Wheaton College uh, now in his 46th year of teaching, and the, there were a number of C.S. Lewis-related privileges that went along uh, with his calling. One was to uh, examine some of the sacred artifacts which now belong to Wheaton's Marion E. Wade collection, and I remember um, being invited into the English department to look at papers that were pulled from boxes, and these were some of the stories illustrated stories that C.S. Lewis wrote when he was a young boy, and it was fascinating to think about um, his imagination, what it was like for him to be a boy, how that led to the stories that he wrote later. And then, of course, there was the wardrobe, which has already been mentioned, uh, the richly ornamented, carved wardrobe, which stood right at the entrance in those days to the English department. It was the wardrobe that uh, had belonged to Lewis's grandfather, had been shipped from Belfast, for reassembly. I should uh, perhaps comment or note that Westmont College in uh, California has rescued a second wardrobe from the kilns from Lewis's home near Oxford. At Wheaton, we always regarded the Westmont wardrobe as an imposter, <laughs> although, although to be fair, it, some say it more closely resembles the description in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But just imagine what it was like to walk by the wardrobe as a young boy and uh, it was always closed for safety, I guess, but I would wonder, you know, what would happen if you stepped inside? You know, did my father ever step inside? After all, who would ever know? Because Narnia time is different from Earth time. You wouldn't even know. I mean, it would just be instantaneous. Um, these were some of the imaginative stimuli of my childhood. Uh, Part of uh, my experience growing up with C.S. Lewis was uh, the way that he was really fun for our whole family. Uh, one of the defining rituals of Christmas morning for us was for my grandfather to receive three gifts, inexplicably a fruitcake, slightly more um, plausibly a bag of lemon drops, and a new hardback volume of C.S. Lewis, and to see the big smile that would come on his face as he anticipated, here is a man who is not college educated, but committed to the life of discipleship, growing through the ministry of C.S. Lewis, uh, the reading that lay in store for him. Uh, my grandmother uh, taught uh, elementary school mathematics at the fifth grade level, but um, she conducted a sort of covert evangelistic uh, crusade by reading her classes, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which, uh, you know, secular school, they couldn't exactly object to, but she was trying to baptize the imagination of her students, reading them a story of a king who offers his life as a substitute for a sinner and then leaps back to life. It's been a joy as a father to introduce the Narnia Chronicles to my children. I remember... Um, just thinking how pleased, in a way, C.S. Lewis would have been when I, my daughter, who was in kindergarten, would come home from school, and she would talk about what they had done during the day, and she would talk about who got to be Lucy or who got to be Susan as they played their imaginative 
um, games during recess, kind of living in the world of Narnia, not just retelling the stories, but entering into those characters and having their own uh, imaginative world. I was also thrilled uh, this fall when my um, daughter, who's a senior in high school, finally got around to filling out her application for Wheaton College. <laughs> and uh, she has uh, been not really a C.S. Lewis enthusiast the way I would want her to be. I asked her what she was writing on for her essay, and she was a little sheepish. She said, Dad, I have become such a cliche. I'm writing my essay for Wheaton on C.S. Lewis. And it was because she had a transformative uh, encounter with C.S. Lewis through reading The Great Divorce and uh, discussing it with her high school class. And um, this was part of her discipleship. Um, our family has had a lot of fun with C.S. Lewis, but it has also been for the glory of God. It's been for the discipleship of the heart and of the mind. Can I mention just three simple lessons about discipleship we can learn from Lewis's life and ministry? Share your faith. Pray for the lost. Read your Bible. These are ways of following Jesus in the way of biblical discipleship until finally you are called to that home where C.S. Lewis as our brother has already entered. Be like C.S. Lewis in the ways that he is like Jesus Christ. And let me begin by talking about sharing your faith. You know, for C.S. Lewis, these are his words. And incidentally, this is one of the great things about being asked to talk about C.S. Lewis. You can use his words. He said that the salvation of human souls was the real business of life. Now, for, for Lewis, uh, sharing his faith did not mean standing in the city center of Oxford and doing street evangelism. He didn't go around asking students or colleagues if they had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He didn't go door to door in Headington Quarry where he lived, passing out tracts or asking his neighbors if you were to die tonight and so forth. In fact, on occasion, Lewis uh, even seemed reluctant to evangelize, at least as we might think of evangelism. His longtime driver, Clifford Morris, observed that he rarely used casual conversation as a context for evangelism. Morris said he was no Billy Graham type at all. And perhaps this was because he was convinced that what we practice, not simply what we preach, is our great contribution to the conversion of others. Those are the words of C.S. Lewis. You hear a little bit of an echo of knowing and doing. The doing is very significant for our proclamation of the gospel. And Lewis also had observed that sometimes we may make, uh, that we may run the risk of making a nuisance of ourselves by witnessing at improper times. And yet if you look closely at the life of C.S. Lewis, you see, the way that he took advantage of opportunities to speak boldly about Jesus Christ and the claims of the gospel. One place where Lewis did this was in the Socratic Club at Oxford University. He was president of that club from 1941 to 1954. It was a club open to atheists, agnostics, even believers in Jesus Christ. And from the beginning, its purpose was to encourage people to ask the question and then discuss it, is the Christian faith true or not? Meetings would begin with a talk on a religious subject by a prominent speaker, not necessarily a Christian, and then there was vigorous open debate. And Lewis always figured prominently in those discussions, arguing from the Christian point of view. The founder of the Socratic Club, a woman named Stella Aldwinkle, remembers uh, Lewis attending a house party for students who had participated in the Socratic Club during a uh, vacation in 1943. I guess I should call it a holiday. Uh, the purpose of this house party was to nurture students who were beginning to get serious about the Christian faith. There were a dozen agnostics that attended that weekend with C.S. Lewis all of them returned to the university professing faith in Jesus Christ. 
And part of that was the personal evangelistic witness of C.S. Lewis, who had been presenting the Christian faith. People were talking to him about Christianity, and as that relationship and friendship developed, he had an opportunity to win people for Christ. Lewis himself was uh, not um, unduly enamored of his own gifts as an evangelist. We get a sense of this from comments that Lewis made about the evangelistic talks that he gave to the Royal Air Force. Early in World War II, there was a mother who had lost her pilot son, and she provided money to the YMCA to sponsor evangelistic work among pilots who were in training for the Royal Air Force. They were trying to wage war on, quote unquote, the forgotten front, the spiritual front, and they invited C.S. Lewis, who had a growing national reputation, to be a speaker. And he wasn't Sure, he was really going to be effective, that he was really a a suitable speaker, but he followed the call of God to be um, a speaker at a number of uh, RAF bases and camps. As Lewis uh, recounts these experiences, he remembers the talks not going uh, particularly well, um, sometimes not very many people in attendance, not very responsive. Uh, One of his letters, he says, I've given talks to the RAF at Abington already, and as far as I can judge, they were a complete failure. Uh, And yet, um, particularly as time went on, Lewis's faithfulness in sharing his faith bore spiritual fruit. Just imagine C.S. Lewis, of all people, thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not that effective as an evangelist, and yet he persevered in sharing his faith having uh, perhaps um, a sense of limitation that many of us feel, and yet remaining faithful. One uh, one minister who accompanied Lewis on some of these uh, talks for the pilots thought that they featured C.S. Lewis at his most characteristic, just, I'm telling you, clear sense. But he also says it wasn't It wasn't a kind of conversion talk, it wasn't any kind of hot gospeling, this uh, minister said. And yet others, as they uh, recount Lewis's effectiveness on these occasions, saw the Holy Spirit bringing great spiritual fruit. One of his colleagues remembers a meeting at Norfolk when uh, Lewis bared his soul to a chapel packed with bomber squadrons. These are men who were going out to battle, many of whom uh, they all knew would lose their lives. And he spoke about the personal cost of following Jesus Christ. He talked about his own discipleship, what it had cost him in terms of reputation and prestige in a university uh, context. He talked about the greater cost of the obedience of Jesus himself. One of the chaplains, after the services were over, telephoned his wife. He said, we've had a wonderful response tonight. Some of the cream of English manhood have come forward to confess Christ as Savior and Lord. Lewis was deeply humbled. He knew it was not his own effectiveness. It was the blessing of the Holy Spirit. He said to one of the chaplains, I wish I could do the heart stuff. I can't. I wish I could. I wish I could press home to these boys just how much they need Christ. You do the heart stuff. I'll do the head stuff. And they agreed together that they would use their own gifts uniquely suited for evangelism and use them in partnership First, Lewis presenting a case for Christianity against objections. Then, the chaplain giving a passionate appeal and invitation to Jesus Christ. Later, Lewis wrote these words, and I think he was thinking about some of these experiences. He said, I'm not sure, but that the ideal missionary team ought not to consist of one who argues and one who preaches. Put put up your arguer first to undermine their intellectual prejudices. Then, let the evangelist proper launch his appeal. I have seen this done with great success. He modestly didn't refer to his own teaching, but I think he had it in mind. Lewis, of course, is perhaps particularly famous as an evangelist for the talks he gave over BBC Radio during World War II, weekly 15-minute talks given in three series later revised and published as Mere Christianity. I'm sure many people here tonight have at least heard that book, if not read it. And those talks were a huge success. They were reaching people who were pondering the ultimate questions of life and death. They were burdened down by the, the, uh, the ravages of war. George Sayer, who had been one of Lewis's students, remembers uh, listening to one of these addresses in a pub that was full of soldiers. And when Lewis came on, the bartender told everyone to listen to this bloke. He's really worth listening to. And what made him worth listening to was his rational defense 
of the Christian faith. Now, I have a feeling that Lewis could do a little bit of the heart stuff as well as a little bit of the head stuff. But it's a reminder that each of us can only be an evangelist in the way that God has given us a calling and to at least some degree a gifting to be an evangelist. We're not all created equal as evangelists, but we all have some gift to share in sharing the message of Jesus Christ. Can I ask you tonight, I, I've been asked to give a talk, but I, I'm a preacher at heart. Can I just ask you tonight, are you using the gift that God has given to you to share the saving message of Jesus Christ with the people within your sphere of influence and connection? You're the missionary that God has called into those relationships. You are the living representative of Jesus Christ. I don't know if it's head stuff for you. I don't know if it's heart stuff for you. I don't know what your gift is. But each of us is called to share our faith. This is basic to Christian discipleship. One of Lewis's correspondents, and many of you will know, um, Lewis had some of the most voluminous correspondents, very faithful in responding to letters and answering people very thoughtfully. He wrote to one man who found himself on the precipice of Christian faith, but not sure how to take the next step. And he, he asked Lewis for help, he, hoping that even if Lewis could not take that leap for him, he might at least give a hint as to how it's done. And there was a series of letters back and forth that followed a friendship that developed Lewis, encouraging his friend's conversion through letters and also prayers. He had the sense that God was, by his spirit, leading this man to give his life to Jesus Christ. He said, I think you are already in the meshes of the net. The Holy Spirit is after you. I doubt that you will get away. This terrified the man, but Lewis was right. He had reached a point of no return. And he wrote soon to Lewis, I choose to believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in Christ my Lord and my God. I confess my doubts. I ask my Lord Christ to enter my life. Just imagine how thrilled Lewis was to receive that letter. He wrote these words in response, my prayers are answered. Blessings on you. A thousand welcomes, a hundred thousand welcomes. Make use of me in any way you please, and let us pray for each other always. Now, it would be easy to miss the significance of what Lewis said there. My prayers are answered. Not a pious cliche, but the literal truth, because for Lewis, prayer and in particular, prayer for people who are lost was central to evangelism and to Christian witness. Here's how Lewis reasoned, if conversion is a work of the Holy Spirit, and if the work of the Holy Spirit is often prompted by the prayers of believers, then prayer is indispensable to God's saving work in the world. In the summer of 1949, Lewis wrote a letter to a Benedictine monk Dom Beatty Griffiths, a former pupil who was in need of encouragement, this is what Lewis wrote, I think a glance at my correspondence would cheer you up. Letter after letter from most recent converts by ones and twos, often what is most hopeful, married couples with children. It amounts to nothing by world statistics, but are those the right standards? I Sometimes I have a feeling that the big mass conversions of the dark ages often carried out by force were all a false dawn and now the whole work of evangelism has to be done over again. Oh, by the way, Barfield was baptized last Saturday. Have him in your prayers. And then this comment. Did you know this about C.S. Lewis? I have two lists of names in my prayers. Those for whose conversion I pray and those for whose conversion I give thanks. The little trickle of transferences from list A to list B is a great comfort. Now that's a significant letter for many reasons. It gives a hint of the evangelistic influence of C.S. Lewis, that he was getting all of these letters from people giving their lives to Christ. It also uh, gives us a, a helpful warning about the dangers of trying to quantify salvation. That's not the point. But it also gives us a glimpse of C.S. Lewis as a man of prayer. Lewis used the Book of Common Prayer daily 
Each month, he prayed his way through all 150 psalms. And it was his regular practice to pray for the unconverted by name and to give thanks to God when those prayers were answered. And that practice extended not only to his personal friendships and relationships, but also to the writing that he was doing. In one, uh, in one place, Lewis writes about his prayer that through his writing, God would help him say things helpful to salvation. Now, you may feel, and if you feel this way, really this is the way you ought to feel, that you don't have the gifts to bring anyone to Christ. But do you have the capacity to say things that are helpful to salvation? If not, may I recommend the Fellows Program of the C.S. Lewis Institute <laughs> as something that can help you say things that are helpful to salvation. But can I also ask what your prayers are, what your habits for prayer are? What, what are the, who are the people you are praying for that God will bring, salva- bring to salvation? If God answered every prayer that you offered over the past week, would there be someone new in the kingdom of God, because that had been part of your prayer life. C.S. Lewis is an example for us of discipleship as a life of prayer, and then equally committed to another means of grace, and this is the third area of discipleship I want to comment on more briefly. Lewis was committed to the written word of God. In thinking about the place of the Bible in Lewis's life and ministry, and the place that it needs to have in my own daily life, an example from Lewis's writings I often think about is the beginning of the silver chair. I hope some of you know that story. At the beginning, young Jill Pohl, who is a schoolgirl, finds herself in a wood at the top of a high mountain. She meets a lion there, maybe you know his name, and he gives her the task of finding a lost prince and bringing him back home to Narnia. That's the quest. And the lion gives Jill four signs to guide her. He tells her the signs. He asks her to repeat the signs. And she doesn't remember them quite as well as she expected to. And so he corrects her. He patiently asks her to repeat the signs until she can say them word perfect in the proper order. But even though she knew the signs by heart, Jill somehow manages to forget most of them by the time she needs them. And um, it starts right at the beginning of the story. Jill and her her, uh, compatriot Eustace uh, forget the first sign, and and Jill says, we've muffed the first sign, now everything is going wrong from the very beginning. And later in the story, the children find that they've missed the second sign, and they've missed the third sign, and Jill says, it's all my fault, I'd given up repeating them every night. Now, I'm not saying here that C.S. Lewis had this exactly in mind, but to me, this story has always illustrated the importance and challenge of the daily meditation on Scripture, that sacred sign for us for the life of discipleship, uh, the daily importance of that and challenge of Holy Scripture in the Christian life, memorizing Bible verses, spending time in God's Word every day, putting what it says into practice. If, if Jill was going to be faithful in her calling, she had to go back every day to the will of Aslan. Of course, he was the lion. And yet, as time went on, she was tempted to neglect that daily time when she recited the four signs. And because of that neglect, she, she and her friends fell into disobedience, into confusion, nearly to the point of death. Well, Whether Lewis had that kind of analogy in mind or not, it's certainly in keeping with the priority that he placed on the Word of God in daily Christian experience. The Holy Scripture is the supreme authority for faith and practice. Reading the Bible has life-giving influence for the believer. These writings are holy, Lewis said, inspired. They are the oracles of God. Lewis wanted his life and doctrine to be surrendered to Scripture. He had a healthy respect for Christian tradition, as many Anglicans do. And yet at the same time, his norm was the Bible. He referred to it as Holy Scripture. In fact, in one of his letters, which he wrote to the editor of the journal called Theology, he said, if we believe that God has spoken naturally, we will listen to what he has to say. And his frustration was people that didn't want to listen to what God had to say. 
Often in uh, Lewis's writings, maybe I shouldn't say often, but at least occasionally, you see Lewis encouraging his friends to surrender their lives to biblical authority. Here are some examples. What we are committed to believing is whatever can be proved from Scripture. Or this, yes, Pascal does directly contradict several passages in Scripture and must therefore be wrong. I take it as a first principle that we must not interpret any one part of Scripture so that it contradicts other parts. Lewis was concerned with what Scripture said. In another one of his letters, he was responding to a woman who had heard skeptical doubts about the miracles in the Bible, and in particular, the virgin birth. Lewis wrote to her, and Lewis had no time for this kind of modern theology at all. He said, your starting point about this doctrine will not, I think, be to collect the opinions of individual clergymen, but to read Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1 and 2. Scripture was the starting point for C.S. Lewis, as it should be for us. One correspondent asked Lewis, What is your view of the daily discipline of the Christian life for the need to be taking time alone with God? Lewis responded using Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6 from the Sermon on the Mount as his authority. He said, here we have our New Testament regimental orders. I would take it for granted that everyone who becomes a Christian would undertake This practice, it is enjoined on us by our Lord, and since they are His commands, I believe in following them. Jesus Christ meant what He said when He told us to seek the secret place and close the door. C.S. Lewis had an extraordinarily fruitful life of Christian discipleship, and this was part part of the secret. It was going to the secret place, being devoted to prayer, and to the Word of God, and then coming out of that secret place to share the saving message of Christ to the world. I was blessed in Lewis's memorial service at Westminster Abbey with the words of Lewis himself in one of those broadcast talks on the BBC as it was played for us. How thrilling it was to hear the voice of C.S. Lewis in Westminster Abbey. He said, the first step towards getting a real self is to forget about the self. This principle runs through all of life from the top to the bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Yes, eternal life, that life into which our brother C.S. Lewis has already entered in which a life to which he invites us to follow him in the way of daily, simple Christian discipleship. As I reflect on the life of C.S. Lewis, it occurs to me that there is hardly anyone from whom I have learned more or had a greater, um, received a greater appetite and longing to enter into my eternal home that home that waits for me and for all of us as followers of Christ at the end of our pilgrimage. And in recent months, as I've been reflecting on the life and death and legacy of C.S. Lewis, I've been um, reflecting on a passage from the voyage of the Dawn Treader. In this passage, uh, Lucy has uh, entered into a house, the house of a magician, and there is a magical book, and she somewhat unwisely is paging through the book and looking at various magic incantations, and she sees a spell for the refreshment of the spirit. And uh, it's actually more like a story, and it's a story that becomes so real she feels like she has entered into the story. And she got to the end, she said, that's the loveliest story I've ever read or shall ever read in my whole life. Oh, I wish I could go on reading it for 10 years. At least I'll go on, I'll read it again. But as she tries to turn back in the book, all of those former pages are closed. There's no way back. And so she tries to remember the story. Oh, what a shame, she said. I did so want to read it again. Well, at least I must remember it. Let's see, it was about, oh dear, it's all fading away again. How can I have forgotten? It was about a cup and a sword 
and a tree and a green hill. I know that much. And not long after that, Aslan comes on the scene, and Lucy wants to ask him about that story. Shall I ever be able to read that story again, the one I couldn't remember? Will you tell it to me, Aslan? Oh, do, do, do. Indeed, yes. Aslan says as her Savior, I will tell it to you for years and years. Maybe you know a story about a cup of salvation, about a sword of the word, about a tree on a green hill where all your sins were taken away. We have a Savior who will tell us that story for years and years. We live in that story now. Praise God for the ways that C.S. Lewis has showed us one example of how to live that story and share it with others. Thank you.